bring something up as artists, and I know there's a little, how many artists do we have here? A good uh, here. Yeah, that's what I thought. Uh, and it's a question I'd love to t talk with others about or hear, hear your comments as, uh, as you feel like shouting, uh, raising your hands. Um, how, how does the experience of being an artist change the experience of living a life? So, you know, I remember when I was writing early on, and I would write everything all the time, diary as a kid, I had it. And I realized at some point I was living my life to write an adventure. To, to duck, and, and now, of course, that's what everybody or a lot of people do on social media, right? You live an event to document. And, um, and I remember at one point feeling I was living in an authentic life. That my point was to tell a story or preach or get a moral out of someone, like to suffer and have a lesson and share that. And so I was just wondering, in, in talking about being an artist at all times, you don't, you don't ever put that away. And you got your phone to record it. And your family knows you're going to do this. Whoever sleeps with you knows that you're going to wake up and document it if you have an idea. Um, how does it affect the experience of living a life? Well, I mean, you kind of cast a, a, a negative light a little bit in that... Um, um, you know, we're not living, we're constantly trying to document the life. I'll, I'll turn that a little bit in that um, my understanding that I am constantly documenting things makes me um, more aware at all times that I am living a life to find things that are interesting to me, understand why they're interesting to me. Um, things that give me great concern and why they give me concern, things that give me hope and why they give me hope, finding language uh, to be able to express those things. I think it's a, a, a beautiful and wonderful way to, to live in that- uh, It's enriched am, the way you live. I am, I think, constantly engaged with being alive mm -hmm. um, because of my awareness that I am never not a writer. Uh, and I don't know if this is something that, it's not something taught, it's just the way I've always been. Is, is there a difference between what I'll call real life and writing? Uh, no, other than th th this is a construct, this is uh, obviously an artifice that's kind of capturing experiences and putting them in an order that we don't really get as uh, in, in real life. Uh, but um, other than that, I'm trying to not have much of a, a a difference between the two. Uh, I mean, that's my hope is when I write something that it is alive in the same way that I'm alive. Um, that's the challenge, at mm -hmm. least. Yeah. And Dale, and then we're really going to go to Alan Reading. Uh, uh, how about for you? How does how does being an artist enhance interfere with just living a life? I think for me, it's it's much less immediate than like what what Al's talking about here. Um, when I end up writing about something, it's it's kicked around in my subconscious for a long time. It's very rare that I sit down with the intention to be like, oh, I'm thinking this. I'm going to document that or express it. You know, like I said, it's it's more emergent, and I have to like figure out what it's about. Um, so, I feel like at least lately. Um, my process is, you know, like you, I'm a I'm a weirdo, and I spend a lot of time by myself doing this stuff. Um, I feel like sometimes almost it can get in the way. Like, you know, I'm like, oh, I need to make more music. And so like, I'll, I'll block off time and maybe like not go on a trip on a weekend and I'll just be sitting in the studio. And that works for a while, but eventually you're like, you know, you need to, you need to put some stuff in the tank to get process to come back out. So I think I need to sometimes do more, do more of that intentionally. And I think also like for me, I was kind of talking to you a little bit about this earlier, like um, it's it's merging a little bit, but I've always felt that like my music life and my my grown up life, which I live now, were almost like alter egos. Because mm. um, when I was younger, like I started college at a traditional age, and I majored in like philosophy and architecture and graphic design, and then I dropped out because I was going to go be a rock band guitarist. And I moved across the country and didn't end up making it or anything. But then I was like, okay, I'm going to come back. I'm going to be an engineer. I'm going to be a grown up and pay my bills. Um, and there was like a gap there where I was like, you know, I'm not doing this anymore. And during that first time, I would say, yes, probably it was more immediate. And like, it was just coming straight in. And, and then when I kind of switched that off, I had to rediscover it. And for, a, for it still kind of feels like separate, you know, like I'm still like, I'm living this grown up life, but now I've got this weird thing hiding in the background and they're starting to merge. But, um, 
yeah, it's kind of strange for cool. me. Well, I, I think that's a great explanation of that duality of uh, existence if you're an artist, because there is a conscious effort to document what is flowing through your brain and, uh, and pass it on. And that's what, that's what culture is, right? Is that every, uh, one thing I tell my students is, you know, I don't believe in creative people. It's, it's, it's bullshit. We all have the exact same hard drive. Uh, unless it's been damaged, and it can be transplanted, I'm sure, someday. Uh, uh, what is different is that the creative person works. <laughs> and my, my proof of that is that, um, that everybody in this room, all the great creative folks tonight, will not have any more creative dreams than your dullest neighbor has. It's a process of this, this hard drive, uh, and uh, uh, the artist that works. And uh, so, with, with with that, Al, would you uh, read us the whatever portion or portions you, oh, you sure, want to? Oh, sure, sure. Let's see if I can hold the mic and open my book at the same time. Um, it's weird reading from a novel because everything is in context with everything else in the book, and you're always going to. I'm aware you'll, you'll be confused as to what's going on, and I'm not going to explain it all because that's boring. And so I'm just going to read some stuff, and you won't know everything that's going on, but just enjoy the words. And uh, here we go. So this is from the perspective of my character, Massey, who's a 20-year-old woman uh, who's uh, in the Army. And... Uh, Eventually, it will sprout wings. In the pre-dawn darkness, I lay awake in my childhood bed, dwelling on Jesus in hell. My first Easter in the army was during boot camp. At the beginning of the service, the chaplain had, recited, had us recite a creed, part of which said that on the second day, after Jesus' crucified body was laid into the burial tomb, and the day before he rose from the dead and rolled away the rock, he descended into hell. In all my Easter's at Western Valley, I'd never heard about Jesus in hell. And staring up in the darkness of my room, I imagined demons taunting Jesus, gnawing his fingers and yanking at his beard. I found the vision comforting, my problems surmountable when proportioned against Christ's burial and descent and resurrection. And come morning, I messaged my old pastor. Pastor Lundquist agreed to meet for lunch. And at noon, we sat across from each other in a booth at Twisty's Diner. A dreary day, locals lined the diner's long counter, the other booths along the windows, mostly empty. I shared my thoughts on Jesus descending into hell. Pastor Lundquist wore faded gray rancher's hat, and he took off his hat, sat it on the seat beside him, then softly corrected that the Bible didn't say any such thing. I tried to shrug it away, but confessed a part of me still wanted to believe it and that it made me feel better somehow. Oh, no, Massey, Pastor Lundquist said. Don't talk like that. And then I was reticent to tell him about the cruelties yet plaguing my mind, what I'd seen and done at the fairgrounds. And the nearest I could approach my suffering was to tell him how Sergeant Nazari said the violence would end all in when we killed all the people who claimed to speak for God. And the pastor grew quiet and wrapped his hands around his steaming cup of coffee. We once had this uh, wealthy congregant he finally said. He owned a place overlooking the bay in San Francisco long before the quakes and storms destroyed it all. He flew me out as kind of a treat, I suppose. He owned the penthouse in this beautiful building, marble floors, a pool on the roof. I found out how much that place was worth, and it was an outrageous number. The pastor set his fingertips to the diner's rain streak window. This is all we have. This world, that view of the bay he spent so much money on, more money than I'd see in 10 lifetimes, money that would feed our entire congregation for years, did him no better than 
us sitting here and looking at trucks in a muddy parking lot and his hand flattened against the glass. We're always hoping to pass through into something better. Better house, better car. Men start wars dreaming of what they'll pass into. But it all comes back to this. This is all we have. Trees, rocks, water, sky. Pastor Lundquist's hand dropped from the window. Unless you have heaven, I have heaven too, but I won't fight for it. No one should ever fight for heaven. Why fight for something that no one can take from you?